This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Leavenworth today. I am happy to be with you. I am Bonnie Grabowski and I am your bridge pastor. So I will be with you for a few weeks. Closer. Closer. Closer to the mic. Closer. All right. So I'm going to ask you to do something radical. Oh no. no. <laughs> Wear your name badges. Because okay. that will really help me to learn who all of you are. Um, some of you I've already uh, learned your names and gotten to know you, but there most of you I do not know, and it's really helpful if you have a name badge, then I can help to associate the name with the face, and I hope to get to know all of you soon. There are announcements in the schedule for the week in your bulletin. Are there any other announcements that need to be made on the floor this morning? All right, seeing them, let us worship God together.
Please stand in body or in the spirit and join me with the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon God's name. Make known the deeds of the Lord among his people. Sing to the Lord, sing praises, and speak of all of God's marvelous works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search the Lord and strength of the Lord. Continually seek the face of God. Please remain standing and let us sing. Make a joyful noise to God. The words of music are on page 54 in your hymnal and the words are on the bulletin. Please let us ponder the 
Romans 8, 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the, that the very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might the firstborn son of a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, whom is it against us? He who did not who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. Will not he with also give us everything? Who will bring our charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is the Lord, it is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, disaster, prosecution, or famine, or weakness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be the slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved, loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, or things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs>
Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 through 33 and 44 through 52. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. There's a Netflix series called Quarterback. Are any of you aware of this? It just came out recently. It follows three quarterbacks last season, in the year 2022. Marcus Mariota, who was at Atlantic Falcons at the time, but who has since been traded to the Philadelphia Eagles, where he's a backup quarterback, Kirk Cousins of the Minnesota Vikings, and Patrick Mahomes. Now, I enjoy watching pro football. I enjoy college football, too. After all, I am from Nebraska. <laughs> And when I was growing up, we had a great team, so that was exciting. But what it did, what this series did, is it really reinforced for me how much work is put into this job, how much training they undergo day in and day out, and how much mental training they have to do. Constantly learning new plays, studying films, mastering the calls that they're going to make. To be a great quarterback requires a tremendous amount of work, and we don't always think about that when we're watching those games. Another appreciation that I have come to has to do with the civil rights movement. As I have read and learned more about it, I came to realize the amount of strategy planning and training that those people who were involved underwent to make it successful. They studied the theory behind it. They practiced how to do it, whether they were going to sit in or sit at a lunch counter or march. There was particular attention paid to how to engage in nonviolent means of resistance, including what to say and how to react. And they did role playing so they could live it out and practice. Of course, in thinking about it, we know that success is rarely serendipitous. Some would say it's 5% luck, 95% hard work. Jesus is training his disciples. He's 
preparing them to assist him in spreading the gospel. Perhaps more importantly, he's preparing them for their future commission, which will, will be revealed at the end of this gospel. What is that commission? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Part of any teaching is helping the students to understand the vision and the goal. To be effective, the disciples need to appreciate what Jesus is seeking to accomplish. It is no small thing. He wishes to restore creation and conform it to God's intentions. In other words, to bring about the kingdom of heaven. In verse 52, Jesus references every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. As we know, Jesus often teaches using parables. This is applicable to them, but also to us, because we have the same commission as those first disciples. And just like them, we need to be informed and equipped, as we, the church, are the body of Christ in the world, and we are responsible for continuing to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to all. The parables today have to do then with understanding what the kingdom of heaven is like. The first two, a mustard seed and yeast, are similar in that they describe how the kingdom grows. The kingdom is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. It begins as the tiniest seed, nearly invisible, and yet grows exponentially. It is a haven, a hospitable place, where nesting birds are sustained. God's kingdom may be present in small and sometimes invisible ways. Even if we don't see it or not aware of it, God is present and active in the world. And the seed grows and becomes something of power and strength. The birds can be understood as literal, but also symbolic. In scripture, birds of heaven sometimes represent the people of nations living under oppression. Indeed, the kingdom of heaven is a place of refuge for those who are oppressed by and in the world. And I have to point out that for some in biblical times, mustard is considered a not to sweet. So if you were here last week, we talked about how we can never be sure what's a weed and what's a, a profitable grain. And so here's another example of the unexpected. The kingdom is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Again, a very small amount of yeast is required in order to leaven a large amount of flour, which in turn will provide enough bread to feed a crowd. A simple step of mixing a bit of yeast with flour will cause it all to become changed. One definition of leaven is a pervasive influence that modifies or transforms something for the better. A reasonable definition for the kingdom of heaven. The presence of yeast might not be detected without the impact that it has over time, and yet it is there and at work. In the same way, God is at work in the world in ways that we may not detect, especially if we aren't paying attention or looking for it. And yeast also can be self-perpetuating, the theory behind sourdough starter. The kingdom of heaven is already fermenting in the world, and it will continue to grow irrespective of any effort to wipe it out. The next two 
parables are similar in that they emphasize the value of the kingdom. The kingdom is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid, then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. John Calvin interprets this parable as illustrating that believers ought to value the kingdom of heaven more than this world. And that we should be willing to give up the things of the world in order to obtain it. He is encouraging the living of a simple and chaste life. On a different note, it might suggest that in order to obtain heavenly treasures, we must be willing to give up all of our earthly possessions to obtain it. The kingdom is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This parable also illustrates the great value of the kingdom. In this case, the merchant is on a quest. The merchant is searching for something of great value. And this suggests the importance of us seeking after God's kingdom. One may happen upon it, but it's more likely if we are really looking for it. The notion of diligence seeking, putting forth effort. Again, the idea is that if the one is willing to stake everything on the kingdom, it will pay off. It will totally be worth it. Finally, the kingdom is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down. They put the good in baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. This parable is similar to last week's when we talked about the weeds and the grain. In that it discusses a gathering in of all, and then a sorting. Those who are evil will be separated from those who are righteous. There will be judgment, with weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the meantime, we live in a world with a mixture of good and bad. This is our reality. And importantly, there still is an opportunity to share the good news of Christ with those who do not yet believe. The message of the gospel should be shared generously with all who might listen so that they too might be saved. When we commit ourselves to Christ and seek to be obedient to him, we commit ourselves to helping to overcome evil in the world and bringing in the kingdom of God. However, in seeking to insist in this undertaking, we are at risk of believing that we would rule the kingdom the same way that God would. This is clearly not the case. The evidence is all around us in the conflicting ways that many of us who profess to be Christians interpret scripture and interact with each other in such varying and different ways. We must always remember that it is God the triune God alone, who brings the kingdom to fruition. Christ invites and commands us to acknowledge and participate in his kingdom, but it in no way depends upon our help and cooperation. Nor is it the same as our efforts and our achievements. The resurrection means that the hope of the world is in Christ, and not in us who are Christians. Thank goodness. The reality of the kingdom of God depends not on what we may one day succeed in doing if we try hard enough and work at it long enough, but on what God has done, is doing, and will do. I want to now circle back to our discussion of training. We are commissioned, just as the disciples were, to go out and share the good news of the gospel. Those of us who are longtime church members may believe that we know enough already to do that. That there is no need for us to be in training. We 
We may say, been there, done that. But I would argue otherwise. First of all, discipleship is a lifelong commitment. And we continuously need to be in training. And secondly, our world has changed so much that what we may have learned over time may no longer even be applicable. The world has changed dramatically, but the denominational church as we have known it during our lifetime has not changed much at all. Church is no longer at the center of our communities. There is no longer an expectation that everybody goes to church. Congregations are shrinking, and in many cases, children are nowhere to be seen. Belief in creeds and confessions have given way to the idea that one need not conform to any particular beliefs, but rather can simply be spiritual. We are living in an age of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, professing no particular religious affiliation. In fulfilling our commission, something different, new, and creative is required. If we continue to, to do what we've always done, what happens? We get the same results. This does not mean discarding that all that we know, as Jesus says, the scribe brings out the treasure, what is new and what is old. But we need to be in training for a different way of doing ministry. We need to be seeking out that new thing that God is doing in this place. As if we were in search of that pearl of great price. And we need to keep discerning how we are called to be a part of the Great Commission in this dramatically changing world. I want to conclude with these words by Joanne Taylor. These parables urge us to abandon whatever we think is most important in life and focus entirely on what God is doing in the kingdom that is already here, already active. The gospel we proclaim must both deserve and explain the label treasure. And our lives must express the ultimate value that is found only in Christ. The kingdom of heaven is a promise that evil will one day be destroyed and righteousness will shine. And in the meantime, it is working in us, changing us calling us to let ourselves be broken open like a seed that dies in order that a plant can grow from it. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing here in this place in number 401.
Christians, we are called not only to be faithful, but to support the ministry and work of the church in the world, and that involves giving of our resources. It is now time when we take up the offering, and you are encouraged to give generously to God's work in this world. If the ushers would please come forward. <coughs>
for the wisdom and will to conserve it. We pray for seasonable weather and for abundant harvests that all may share. And may any who are hungry be fed. Lord, in your mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widows and orphans, for the sick and suffering, we ask that their needs be met. Be with the poor and the oppressed, the unemployed and the destitute, the prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Listen now as we lift to you our silent prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, you are protector of all who put their trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Fill us with your mercy and your grace, that with you to rule and guide, we may so use the good things of this present life, that we do not neglect those of eternal worth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> benediction hymn, you servants of God, your master proclaim, number 299.